So we want to welcome you this morning. Um, pray that you've enjoyed a bit of the worship. And so, one of the things for me during this lockdown is um, not having being able to have a haircut. I don't know how it is with everyone else, mm. but as you can see, my hair is growing significantly, quite long. <laughs> and uh, I think it's the longest it's been in a long time. So. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's other things that we miss. I was talking to someone, as I do in the morning when I go for a walk, I go and have a coffee, and I actually said to them, um, I think I've forgotten what it's like to even sit in a cinema these days. Um, and so you just think of all the things that you used to do, yep. um, but there's also things that um, come with the lockdown and restrictions that have caused us to uh, reevaluate so much in our life. And, and I suppose this morning I just want to, uh, rave a little bit about about that, and about resilience and about freedom. Um, I think the last time I shared, I talked about creating touch points in your life um, and touch points that are sort of more, you know, biblical touch points, but also uh, touch points that you just have like in the morning when I go for a walk, that's one of my touch points. Uh, for a biblical touch point could be a scripture that's, you know, really encouraging to you at this present time. And so they're, they're really important to have because they actually centre you on um, things, uh, probably more so it centres you on what the real issue is rather than the things that are all around us through media and things. So, um, you know, and resilience, I think, um, where do you find that resilience during this time? And, and I think that uh, for me it's you find that resilience in your identity in Christ. And it's as you d delve into the depths of who you are in Christ that you find that resilience. Um, and, you know, even though the restrictions have logical reasons, your mind, it doesn't help your mind and your feelings sometimes. They wander off. Um, I don't know if any of you have had that. And, um, you know, we even though we know it's logical in the sense of health issues and things, but but as your mind begins to wonder, you can't help but think, is there some, s you get these sneaky suspicions that there's more to it. And then your mind keeps going down into these dark corridors of hidden agendas and things like th that that loom in the darkness. And, um, and so I'd started to dwell on this and think about, you know, where, does it, where do I sit with all this? And, and so it, is it okay to have an opinion and, uh, about what's going on? Of course it is okay. That's how we're made. And is it okay, you know, all right to whinge? I don't know. I think that's an Australian thing. Perhaps it's a, a body, everybody thing to whinge. Or be an armchair politician so I can post, you know, on Facebook uh, or on the media, whatever media site you use, just so that I satisfy my need to be heard and hopefully got my little bit of sarcasm there. Um, but with all the, you know, all our, a lot of our freedoms being taken away, um, I wanted to encourage you today with some scriptures. And even though we physically have those freedoms taken from us that create pressures within our life, we in fact are free. We are still free. I want to quote two people today. One's, the first one's from Corey Ten Boom. It said, only those who have been in prison know what, f what freedom is, know what freedom, what the meaning of freedom is. Mm -hmm. And there's another quote from a man that was 23 years in a Soviet prison camp. He said, the fullest freedom I've ever known, the greatest sense of security came from abandoning my will to, to only do the will of God. And so here are some scriptures that talk about the freedom that we do have. In John, it talks about, and you know the truth and the truth will set you free. And also in John, he says, so if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. And in Galatians, it talks about this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not uh, let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And in Psalm 119, verse 45, I will walk about in freedom for I, for I have sought out your precepts. And even though we are physically restricted, only you can decide whether your soul and spirit are restricted as well. So, you know... And I think this is where I want to sort of head a little bit this morning. I want to draw your attention to some uh, scriptures, like some that I've just shared. But um, because we're going through so much, 
just to draw your attention to the freedom that we have in Christ. And we know that um, because of that freedom that we have in Christ, we can be, in a sense, restricted, but we have this freedom that we can reach out to God through the time that we're living in. And so one of the things I started to read was about what does the scripture actually say about governments and all that. And I'm going to probably touch on a subject here that, that might be a little bit tricky, but um, hopefully you'll, you'll hear my heart. Um, and yes, we've, we've all been going through these restrictions that the government have put in place. And, and please, as I, I want to preface uh, what I'm saying, that I'm not um, saying that you can't have a voice, but I just want to throw some scriptures at you this morning that help maybe bring some balance to everything that's going on. In Daniel chapter 2, Verse 20, Daniel said, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise man and knowledge to the men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. him. And this is just one scripture out of Daniel that that actually is talking about the sovereignty of God, that he actually removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men. He reveals things that are hidden and brings them to light. And so just that focus that God is sovereign. And then in Daniel chapter 4, and it talks about Nebuchadnezzar, you'll be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You'll be given grass to eat like cattle and seven periods of time will pass over until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and sets it and and is bestowed on it whoever he wishes. So it's actually saying he, God is in control. He is sovereign. And in Jeremiah 27 verse 6, it says this, Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, Notice that he called Nebuchadnezzar God his servant and I have given him also the wild animals of the field to serve him. So again, it's establishing the sovereignty of God. And when um, Pilate, you know, when Jesus came before Pilate, he said, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For, the, for this reason, he, de- he who delivered me up to you has the greatest sin. The powers or authorities here are seen not in individual personalities but as officers of the law whose positions are ordained by God. That is the various officers of civil authority appointed by God. So the structure of government and the laws connected with it are appointed by God and means and they're there to promote law and order here on earth. Just a quick read of these verses I've just shared. It says that human government is a Uh, an institution brought about by God for the regulation of human affairs. But there is a higher authority, which we all know. And that's where I want to centre your thoughts today as well. But there is another scripture in Romans chapter 13, and I'm sure you know where I'm heading with this, but Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, it says this, Every person is to uh, to be in subjection to the governing authorities. So this is Paul talking. So there is no authority except from God and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God and they have opposed and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Isn't that an interesting verse? For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will praise. You will have praise for the same. For it is a minister of God to you for for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience sake. For because of this, you pay taxes for rulers. Rulers are servants of God devoting themselves to this very thing, render to all what is due to them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. Now, I could go and unpack that verse, but I would just encourage you to, today to go and read it again. And it's an interesting verse in Romans, pretty wild. 
You know, the, the Bible actually commands us as Christians to submit to governing authorities. And, and actually in Timothy, it actually says to pray for kings who are in authority, that we might lead a peaceful and quiet, quiet life. And doesn't, in that scripture we just read in Romans, doesn't it sort of remind you of Jesus when he said, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God's. And it actually is a command there that Jesus is actually saying. It's an imperative, something that we need to do. But it's one scripture I want to try and unpack which re-emphasizes the scripture in Romans. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. And it basically says the same thing that Paul was saying in Romans. And Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. He says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it to be the emperor, some translations might say king, as supreme, or the two governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honour everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honour the emperor, which means honour the king. Peter wrote this to persecuted Christians. And they were suffering, they were going through things, just as Paul wrote as well. From my understanding, at that time, Nero was ramping up his persecution against Christians. Peter himself was martyred around 68 AD by Nero. So, you know, it's very interesting. They were in perilous times. And so what is this scripture actually saying to us today? What does it mean? Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those to do good. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution. You see, submission is not a natural reaction for man. It's actually a supernatural reaction as we allow the Holy Spirit to control our lives and our attitudes. Submission in the simplest terms is about not seeking your own interest. Uh, It's actually relinquishing one's rights to another person. And in this Greek, in the Greek in this scripture, it actually means literally to be placed under in an orderly fashion. They used it as a military term to draw up in battle, in other words, to form and marshal the troops together and they arrange them in a military fashion. In a non-military sense, the word submission here means actually a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility or carrying the burden. And really what Peter is saying, it's actually an imperative again, it's a command to all believers to submit as citizens in the world and under the civil law and authority. Um, And the most important thing that this text does is to give us an insight into the social and political life that we should lead in relation to God. Someone has actually once said that the Bible is not a book about how to get along in the world, it's a book inspired by God about how to live for God. So our whole aim aim in life is to live for him. Um, Even though we're under this authority, we're still under a greater authority, which in fact is the sovereignty of God, that he is ultimately in charge, the higher authority. But in that same breath, I can say that Peter is emphasizing the fact that we are, you know, under the authority of the earth as we live today and under those institutions. And it's interesting, you know, we know that we are of another kingdom. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. It, Peter actually even talks about that a bit earlier in, the, in chapter 2. And, and he talks about us being strangers and pilgrims. And so in one sense he's saying, yes, you belong to this kingdom where God is sovereign and he rules over all, but you also live on this earth and you're under that submission. You must. He's actually saying the imperative here, I command you or I, I encourage you to actually submit to authorities. And he actually says in verse 15, for this is the will of God that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. And that, sil- that word silence is an interesting word. It actually means to muzzle the beast's mouth. It means to close the mouth with a muzzle. And really it's actually saying to silence your adversary so that every accusation is taken out of their mouth. The idea is to stop 
one's mouth so to silence them, to make them spe speechless, to reduce them to silence. So he's saying, for this is the will of God and by doing good, you shall put them to silence. And Matthew actually uses the same word in the book of Ma Matthew um, when, he, when Jesus puts the Sadducees to silence. And, um, it, and when he heard the Pharisees, the same thing, it, Jesus used the word again in that sense of actually to muzzle them. And when Jesus calmed the storm in the book of Mark, he, the translation there is the same word, is that, that the silence of the storm, in other words, to muzzle what was going on. And Jesus actually used the same word when he spoke to, to demons. In fact, it's like a vigorous verb. It's actually a very powerful verb that is used. And really he's saying, let your light shine before men that they will see your good, work, good works and they may glorify that your Father is he in heaven. Peter's aim for us is that we live such spirit-filled lives of godliness that the slander of Christianity will be silenced. In essence, he's saying instead of being against something, have the remedy for it. Um, and in this, he's actually saying in submission, in the fact we're actually, well, as we submit to that authority, we're actually glorifying God as part of our walk as believers. And of course, as we all know, there are ex exceptions to this, to what he's saying, uh, where, you know, if, it, if it's something that um, goes contrary to the word of God, then that is not, we, we shouldn't actually submit at that point. So, if if a human government orders believers to act contrary to to the revealed will of God, then in essence we should disobey the government. And I'm not saying that you should go out and and do all that all of a sudden, because we are responsible to a higher authority. Um, in verse 16, he actually says, "Live as people who are free, not using your freedom to cover up for evil, but living as servants of God." And it's a freedom that we have, but it's not a license to si to sin. It's a freedom that's found as only as we submit to Christ. And it's a freedom that comes as we build that relationship with Christ. We're not free to do what we like. We are free to do what we ought. And it actually, that freedom, if you read it, it's freedom, it's freedom from the law, freedom from the curse of the law, freedom from the fear of death, freedom from sin, freedom from corruption, freedom from the bondage of man, freedom from Jewish ordinances, and freedom from, um, you know, from so much. We're called to be saints. We have this freedom that we have as a result of walking with Christ. And in this verse, it actually says, you know, live as people who are free, not using your freedom to cover up evil, but living as servants of God. So he's saying, have, live that freedom, but don't allow that freedom to be an excuse or, or a pretext or an agenda that actually covers up um, or a veil that uh, as a cloak that covers up do not use your freedom in Christ as a pretext or as an agenda for doing something that you think you should do Peter warns them not to use their freedom for doing wrong instead we use our liberty in Jesus to show the kindness and love and respect that we should do and he actually says we are free but we're also servants and in that scripture, it actually means bond slaves or bond servants. In other words, we have been bound to Christ. We were bought with a price. We are, a, you know, we are actually slaves to Christ. He is our master. He is sovereign within our lives. We're obligated to do his will, uh, desire to do his will. And in a sense, we are his slaves as well. We are his bond servants. And we should actually be consumed with the will of the master. And it's an incredible word picture. Like I said before, it's Christ has bought us with a price. We were brought with the blood of the Lamb. Every breath that we have, every effort that we have, that's the picture of the bondservant. And it, to honour is actually to actually attribute worth and merit to, to that person. I just want to jump ahead. He actually talks about love here as well. And the love is actually agape. And he's saying here, again, that brotherhood love, that love that we should have one an for another and have those, you know, um, feelings to one another, one another to encourage each other. 
and that we're out, out of a brotherhood that we are born in the same womb. So today, as Christians, we are in this brotherhood that we should love each other as brothers and sisters, filled with the Spirit. Um, and the fear in that, that verse actually is actually reverence towards God as well. See, submission doesn't mean we don't, um, we don't work to make the situation better. It, sometimes we must speak out against things that are wrong, but we live under authority. It's the greatest freedom of all that we have. It protects us and di gives direction and it gives security. So we need to show the world true freedom, freedom comes by submitting to God. In, in the end, submission is not about you obeying someone else or about you following a set of rules. Submission is a, a spiritual issue between you and God. It touches every part of life because behind every human authority, the Lord stands himself. So it is God who raises up and pulls down. It is God who pl puts people in authority over us. Every Christian, no matter what form of government he lives under, is commanded by the Lord to maintain maintain proper and useful submission to that government for the sake of leading a peaceful life and having an effective witness every part of our salvation affects our relationships um, even to the government god is sovereign over human events at the same time he gives us freedom to make our own choices and to make our own way in other words no one can become a king or an emperor or a governor or a premier or a president apart from God's will. But this doesn't mean that possess possession of political power amounts to a stamp of approval from God. This is where will comes in, the will of the creation and, and the sense of, and how we direct that as well. The long and the short is really God is always in charge. We may not trust the things that are going on around us at the moment, and we, and I don't believe God is saying that we should be blind, but we should never forget that the power of human ruler rulers are subject to a higher power, because God is absolutely sovereign. In it, in any situation, He is sovereign. I remember a scripture uh, in Mark where Jesus actually says, um, "This is very interesting because you know one of the things before I quote the scripture." is that because of the, the uh, society that we live in today, we have so much things that come and uh, infiltrate our lives through media and through just conversation. We have, we're connected in so many ways, but as Glenn said this morning as well, it's, it's sometimes we miss that face-to-face -face at the moment, but we're still connected. We, have, we can invite anyone into our lounge room today and we can listen to whatever comes in and you know with all that's been going on even with uh, the quarantine inquiry and the political nature of everything uh, there's this interesting scripture in mark even though i've said about the submission to authorities it's understanding also that god is sovereign and that he's in control he is in in charge of all that's going on we need to trust him but also set our hearts towards prayer and enable the enactment of the power of God to move into our nation and into our city. But Jesus said this, and I, you know, it's sort of like a bit of a warning. He's, the disciples had forgotten to bring some bread in Mark chapter 8, and, and except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. And he, Jesus said this in verse 15 of chapter 8, Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And, it, and, and it's interesting, we can get so involved in what's going on around us that we miss what really is going on. In other words, we can't see the wood for the trees. Mm -hmm. And this morning I want to encourage you to set your eyes, look above and say, God is sovereign, trust him, he is in control. And say, God, how do you want me to pray into that situation? I don't want to get involved in the political um, rhetoric that's going on at the moment I want to see your heart for our nation and our state and I think Jesus was really saying this he said be careful watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees of the religious system but he's also of Herod as well which is the political system that we can so easily get wrapped in up in and, and opinions that are flying 
here and there and everywhere. I want to hear what God's heart, what is God saying at the moment and how we should pray. Yes, I'm in submission to authorities because under that submission, that br brings the blessing of God as well. But also I'm in submission to the authority, the sovereignty of God. And it's interesting, you know, the, the, the uh, disciples didn't get it because after that in verse 16, they said they discussed this with one another. And they said, it's because we have no bread that he said these things. And, you know, they didn't really hear what he was saying. And today, may I encourage you to really hear what God is saying, not what everyone else is saying. And here's a prime example in Scripture. The disciples thought they were hearing what he was saying, but they really didn't because they just started to talking about bread, that we have no bread. That's why he said these things. And this morning, if anything, I just want to encourage you to set your heart to hear the voice of God and what he's saying. And yes, there is so many different agendas going on around us at the moment and we can they grab our attention and they say, listen to this, say this, have this opinion. This is what's really going on. Here's this conspiracy here. This is going over here. But let me encourage you from first, you know, from Peter and also from, um, you know, the book of Romans and it's also in Titus as well, chapter 3 where it talks about us submitting, that, that, that at the same time as we do our good wor works, it will shut the mouth of the accuser as well. But not only that, to hear uh, what God is actually saying during this time. And, and for me, that's the priority here. I can listen to all those things. They can come into like a big bowl, a big mixing bowl, and mix them all together. But really, I want to hear the heart of God and what he's saying at this time. And, you know, we might... You know, it's all right to have an opinion. That, that's not the issue here. It's where your heart is sitting. What is your attitude of heart towards what's going on around us at the moment? And so this morning, I just want to close in prayer. So, Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that part of what you've said here, Father, is a challenge to us. Lord, just as it would have been in the day of Paul and when Peter lived as well, Father, and when Titus lived, there was much persecution. Father, they were seeing Christians killed as a result of their faith. But it's so interesting to me that Paul encourages them to submit to authorities as well, Father, because they are put in place because God has put them there. And that's sort of pretty shocking to us today, some, some of the things that have gone on. But Lord, we pray at this moment in time, let us have ears that hear, let us have discernment to hear what the voice of God is saying, Father. We block out the ears of what the media and everyone else around us are saying and say, God, we want to hear your voice and we want to walk in your precepts. Father, we want to have the attitude of heart that you have. Lord, we want to have that right attitude before you that we are truly your bond servants, that you are our master. But we declare that you are sovereign in this place today. You are sovereign in this state, Father. You are sovereign in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, guys.